the first talk of today, which is by, let me just, yeah. I'm just waiting for Hema to join so that we can start. I am. Um, I'll introduce you and then you can share your screen. Okay. Start. Is the volume okay, Abby? Yeah, the volume looks okay. Good. Okay. So in this session, I would like to um, introduce our next plenary speaker, uh, Professor Hema Somanathan. She is a professor in biology at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, uh, Thiruvananthapuram, India. She completed her PhD from the University of Bombay, working on plant pollinator interactions. Subsequently, she was a Werner Grand Postdoctoral Fellow at Lund University, uh, Sweden, from 2006 to 2009, working on the sensory ecology of nocturnal and diurnal bees. She joined Isar Thiruvananthapuram as an assistant professor in August 2009, and her research interests lie in understanding the evolutionary ecology of plant pollinator interactions, sensory behavior of social and solitary bees and collective behaviors in social spiders. Today, she will talk about bees, and her title is Bees Beyond Twilight. Over to you, Hem. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Um, I'm going to share the screen now. Please let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see your screen now. Yeah, is that okay? Yes, yes, I think that's good. Uh, first of all, let me uh, start by thanking uh, the organizers of uh, Animal Behavior Life. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for researchers all over the world to sort of, you know, be familiar with each other's work and get to meet each other. And I'm looking forward to the interaction sessions later today evening. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, you know, the work that goes on in my group. Uh, so essentially, I'm going to be summarizing about work that has been happening for over a decade. Um, this work essentially started out with me as a uh, during my postdoc times. And then, you know, it, I continued this with uh, students working with uh, master's PhD students in my group at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. And so there have been several people who sort of contributed to this work. Uh, this is just a snapshot of our campus. It's beautifully nestled in the Western Ghats in the Southern part of India. And this is my lab um, group. And uh, we there are PhD students, there are postdocs, um, undergraduates and master students here in the picture, some interns. Uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about today is work that I've collected data on myself and also um, the two people who have whose work I will be discussing today, the later work, is Balu, who was a postdoc in the lab and he's now moved on to being a postdoc in Newcastle. And Sajesh is a senior PhD student who's looking forward to submitting his thesis in a month or so. Uh, so uh, I'll begin by talking a bit about how species manage to coexist. And one of the most obvious ways in which species manage to coexist is that they find a space for themselves. As you can see in this uh, you know, shared office where there are cubicles and there are workers in each cubicle, and that's how space is partitioned. So everybody has their little corner or their little niche. Now, though this is uh, possibly very often discussed in terms of species and their distributions and the habitats that they occupy, there are many more ways in which species can coexist. And some of those could be that, you know, you have the type of habitat uh, that is that species occur uh, in, the kind of resources that they utilized, there could be behavioral differences between species, there could be temporal differences in activity times between species. 
There could be morphological differences between species that allow them to coexist. For example, say differences in the way they feed, or feeding structures, or it could be, uh, you know, locomotive structures. It could be body size and so on. And, uh, you know, uh, differences in physiology. So uh, today what I'm going to be uh, focusing on is, is this really uh, unique sort of evolutionary phenomenon where bees that, you know, we normally think of bees as being diurnal organisms. And a lot of what we know about bees, and there is a very rich body of literature on bees, is sort of because of, you know, what we know about the work that started with, uh, you know, a discovery of the dance communication in honeybees, uh, for which Carl von Fisch is credited, and he won a Nobel Prize. So, in the last century or so, there has been a lot of information on that has uh, sort of accumulated from uh, you know various groups, uh, which today we know as a result of all of this work that bees can use. Uh, solar compass and they can also use landmarks for navigation and since they are flower feeders they locate flowers using multiple floral cues such as odor color smell shape texture and so on there's also you know recently discovered cues such as temperature and and other things but we also think or the popular opinion is that bees stop flying around sunset meaning that they are sun loving organisms they start their activity with sunrise and they stop their activity and at sunset now, we also know that the uh, bees have excellent color vision. Flower, angiosperm flowers are colorful, and bees have excellent color vision, which allows them to detect flowers using color, and also they are very good at learning colors. So uh, this is the classical experimental paradigm that is still used because it's an elegant framework, uh, which, again, was the experiments done by Carl von Fisch, where he actually showed that bees can be trained and they can learn to make associations between a color, in this case, a blue color and a sugar reward. Okay. And then once the bees were trained, he could, uh, he tested these bees and he could, uh, he, he was able to find out or discover that they could learn the color very well and distinguish it from other shades of gray, some of which matched in uh, brightness with the training blue or they were darker or they were lighter. So this paradigm is still used today, and we use it a lot in a lot of bee uh, behavioral work. So what do we know about bee color vision? We know that, uh, you know, uh, just, just like humans, they are trichromatic, which basically means that they have three different kinds of photoreceptors. But the difference here is that while humans have a red receptor, bees don't, most bees don't have a red receptor. And instead, what they have is a UV receptor. So that makes them trichromatic with UV blue and green receptors. Now, the implication for this is that bees see flowers differently from how humans see flowers. Now, below here, what you can see is a representation of, of flowers as we see it in natural light. And this is, uh, you know, under what it might appear to bees which have UV vision. We can never say what a flower looks like to a bee, but you know we could use UV. Uh, you know we could uh, photograph flowers under UV patterns that jump out, which are otherwise not visible uh, to humans. Now the other thing about bees is that they have um, all insects have compound eyes, and compound eyes, unlike our eyes, have. food, finding mates, finding the way back home and so on, using uh, a compound eye, which is not great in terms of resolution. Now, further, the fact that this design is not great in terms of resolution is further worsened by the fact that in smaller, uh, you know, when the body size gets smaller or when uh, insects become nocturnal, then the vision gets even crappier. So what happens when you have smaller eyes is that you have, say, fewer numbers of omatidia and you have, uh, you know, the omatidial diameters decrease. And as a result of which you have the resolution or what we say the acuity of vision gets affected. 
Okay. And the, here is a very famous cartoon, which actually, uh, you know, very nicely points to the fact that if humans were to have compound eyes, then they would need an eye as large as this, which is about, you know, a meter in diameter, basically. So essentially, insects are much smaller, the body sizes are smaller, and so therefore they can only afford to have small compound eyes, which makes the vision quite, uh, you know, coarse. And further, when there is a reduction in either body size or when, uh, you know, insects shift towards nocturnal activity, then uh, resolution becomes an issue. Now, if you look at uh, visual adaptations in bees, so there are constraints both uh, which I just spoke about in terms of miniaturization. So in this uh, graph, what you have is you have eye length on the uh, y-axis and you have uh, you know, body size on the x-axis. And you can see here that with miniaturization, for example, as you see in the stingless bee over here, the resolution of the eye becomes really poor. And on the other hand, you have very large bees, which have large eyes. And so with large eyes, you can sort of do better in terms of resolution. Now, resolution and sensitivity has not been estimated in many bee species. The most classic example comes from Atus mellifera over here. But recently, the literature has been enriched. And we do have data from our group where we've looked at uh, spatial resolution of vision in uh, Apis serana and as well as in Apis dorsata and in this tiny stingless bee over here, which is Trigona. Now, since this talk is about bees beyond twilight or after twilight, uh, there was this, um, you know, we don't know of too many bees that are active under dim light levels, but there have been, uh, you know, sort of anecdotal records of night activity uh, in bees. Right, the most well-studied nocturnal bee would be the sweat bees from Panama, the Panamanian sweat bees, which belong to the genus Megalopter. Uh, and following that, possibly we have, you know, the carpenter bees, which our own group works on. And we all, all of what we know about nocturnal bees comes essentially from these two species. Now you can see here that when you look at bee families, you can see that nocturnality or dim light activity is quite prevalent in several bee families. It appears to be a derived trait with diurnal uh, activity being the ancestral trait. Now today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about nocturnality in the apidae within this family, uh, basically focusing on two species, that is the obligately nocturnal carpenter bee and a facultatively nocturnal honeybee, which is Ipis dosata. Now, the reason why we are, we are going to be talking a lot about temporal shifts over here. Now, when we think about bee activity, we do know that you know, several species of coexisting bees can shift their activity within a temporal period, which means that they can either start their activity early in the morning, or there are some species that start their activity later in the morning when the light levels are better and so on. And similarly, they can also, there could be differences in when they, uh, you know, end their activity. And that is what we would call as within phase shifts, okay? Now, these are fairly common, right? And most of, uh, you know, people working on bee communities uh, have recorded this. Now, the other kind of shift is where you have this inversion, where you go from being, uh, you know, diurnal to being nocturnal. And the issue here is that, you need to really develop, the, evolve the machinery that is required to go with such phase inversion shifts. And so therefore, it's not surprising that phase inversion shifts are quite rare. And nocturnality in bees essentially represents one such phase inversion shift. And the interesting thing here would be to ask two questions, two broad questions. One is about why did bees turn nocturnal? And second is what is the machinery or how did they turn nocturnal. And today I'm going to be talking about both of these, uh, trying to cover breadth rather than depth. So what is the issue with these phase inversion transitions as far as bees are concerned? The primary issue is that they have the compound eye and they have the kind of compound eye which we call as the apposition eye. And here in the apposition eyes, the issue is that you have the individual omatidia with a lens and you have the rhabdoms, which contain the photoreceptor cells, right? The photoreceptor types. Now, the light that is received by a rhabdom 
essentially is defined by the diameter of the lens. Okay. So, and you have screening pigments in between, which prevents uh, light from, you know, from neighboring omateria to be received by uh, a particular random. Okay. So what happens is when this eye is fantastic, as long as there's enough light, but when light levels drop, then, and when photon capture becomes uncertain or unreliable, so then you can't have a strong enough signal, which means that vision gets affected. So this is the primary problem. And we know that bees have this kind of eye, which is why most bees are diurnal and they stop their activity when light levels fall. But despite having apposition eyes, some bees do manage to make their eyes sensitive enough in order to be able to uh, have a nocturnal uh, lifestyle. So uh, essentially, when you think about an eye, there are two uh, important sort of things to consider. And one is that an eye can have very good resolution. And that resolution comes from having uh, several pixels or several omatidia, which uh, you know we can sort of think about pixels and uh, omatidia as being uh, sort of, uh, you know, as pixels being a good analogy for uh, omatidia. And the, uh, the, the consequence is that when you have uh, a number of omatidia, uh, then you could have uh, higher resolution of vision. And that is why you find uh, that diurnal insects possibly have, you know, many more omatidia than uh, nocturnal insects. And in the case of nocturnal insects, what becomes more important is that each facet or each omatidia is as wide as possible, which allows them to receive as much light as possible. Okay. So in nocturnal insects, what happens is that there is a trade-off between resolution and sensitivity where they make their eyes uh, coarser or they make vision coarser in order to make it much more sensitive at low light levels. So this trade-off is something to be kept in mind when we think about nocturnality in bees. So uh, this is something that, uh, you know, uh, nocturnal insects in general, including bees, how do you actually turn nocturnal? One is that you have to make your eyes more sensitive because yes, we know that bees are primarily visual organisms. And so therefore, you know, vision plays a very important role. And secondly, is that you can, you would have to sacrifice, do you do this by sacrificing temporal and spatial resolution? Okay. So for uh, you, you, you make your vision much coarser in order to be able to make it much more sensitive to be operational at low light levels. Now, we do know from many studies that uh, with respect to the design of nocturnal eyes, one obvious adaptation would be to have a larger pupil. Okay, you make your pupil larger so that you can gather many more photons of light. You have a larger solid angle, which is the, uh, you know, the angle over which in space over which you can receive light into the eye. And you have better absorption of incident light. So these are things, the design parameters that must be improved in order to be able to see something at night. Now, the other is the why question, which is why do, uh, why have bees taken the trouble to be nocturnal? Or why has nocturnality evolved in bees? Now, with respect to uh, nocturnality in bees, there has been, uh, there have been three hypotheses that, you know, sort of many of it is not very rigorously tested very hard to test these things, but we know that, uh, you know, uh, possibly it could be in relation to a rich uh, nocturnal floral resource niche that's available for these bees at night, which they are trying to exploit. It could also be an effect of competition where competition from other flower visitors is lower at night, and it could also be in order to avoid predation risks. So here, what I'm going to do is quickly look at uh, two species. One is the obligately nocturnal carpenter bee, which occurs in, in India and, and in other parts of Southeast Asia. And the um, honeybee, which is Apis dorsata. It's also called the giant honeybee, which also occurs in India and in South and Southeast Asia. So let's look at the first system, right? The carpenter bees are an attractive system to study this or to address these kinds of questions because you have several sympatric species. For example, in the study site that we work in, we have a strictly diurnal species, which is Dilocopa leucothorax. We have an, uh, a species that is in between, which is 
It's largely diurnal, but it can be nocturnal to some extent. It doesn't go all the way down to uh, starlight, but it can be uh, nocturnal occasionally when on brighter moonlit nights. And then you have the third species, which starts its activity after sunset and ends its activity just before sunrise. Now, here is a study site, the habitat where these bees uh, reside or uh, occur. So bees can be found in, uh, you know, uh, uh, on trees like this. Uh, carpenter bees can inhabit trees like this, or they can be found inside the forest canopy. So uh, here light is more limiting, here light is less limiting. So these are all environments or microhabitats within which these bees are found. Now they're called carpenter bees simply because they use dead wood, uh, dead logs like this in order to nest. And here you can see the, uh, you know, uh, a nest that has been opened up and you can see the tunnels inside where the bees reside. They store the pollen and nectar and, uh, you know, they take care of the brood and the brood develop inside within these tunnels. Uh, here is a nest and here is a diurnal carpenter bee outside the nest. Now, this is how the flight activity looks like in these three species. So you have the strictly um, diurnal species that is active during the daytime at higher light intensities. And here on this axis, you have the time uh, before and after sunset. Uh, then you have the in-between species that is largely diurnal, but it does extend a bit into moonlight, you can see. And this is occasionally, not regularly. And you have the third species, which starts its activity at much at moonlight levels, 30 minutes after sunset, and goes all the way down to very dark light levels. Yeah. Now, this is the first experiments that we did, where we confirmed that they do, in fact, rely on vision at low light levels to uh, actually do a very uh, you know, difficult task, which is to find their way back home. Right. When they find flowers, it's possibly that they're using other kinds of cues such as, you know, odor and things like that. But to find their way back to the nest, they possibly, which is, you know, often under the canopy, as I was just mentioning, is possibly a much more challenging task because nests are not particularly visual or attractive or colorful and things like that. And uh, these experiments were done by, uh, so you have a nest over here and uh, we train bees by placing a landmark over the nest and the bees are allowed to get used to the landmark for a few nights. And this is a video of a bee that exits the night. This is the trajectory of a bee. And after the bee has left the nest, then we displace the landmark to the top or to the side or to the bottom. And then we wait for the bee to come back and then record the flight. So usually what happens is that the bee uh, has learned to associate the nest with the landmark and goes straight for the landmark and not finding the nest behind the landmark, then they begin to search quite uh, frantically for the nest. Yeah. Uh, this is another uh, video of the same thing where the bee, this is the exit, and this is the entry after the landmark has been displaced. So what these experiments tell us is that they do use landmarks at low light -like levels, and they can see these landmarks at low light -like levels. We also did these, uh, you know, sort of homing studies under different lunar conditions, uh, lunar phases, full moon, half moon, and uh, third and first quarter. And here again, what you can see, these red, uh, you know, lines are the trajectories of the bees under these different light levels. And they um, do pretty well, and they can find their way back home, uh, even at pretty low light levels. So it tells us that they're quite efficient in using vision at such low light levels. Now, here is uh, what we then did was we looked at the eyes of these bees. And you can see here, this is the diurnal, strictly diurnal species. This is the in-between species. And this is the nocturnal species. They're all roughly of the same size. They're all large bees, pretty large actually. And uh, you can see that the eyes of the nocturnal species is much larger for a body uh, in relation to the body size in the nocturnal species. And you can also see that the ocelli, which are the simple eyes that, um, you know, probably are not very well focused, but they, uh, you know, do are, you know, are thought to be implied in, um, in flight stabilization or they act as light sensors and so on. 
uh, these ocelli, these three ocelli are oriented in the skyward direction in the nocturnal bees. And it's also much larger than in the two diurnal species. Yeah. Uh, then we looked at the, um, you know, the rhabdoms. And this is the, uh, you know, the TEM uh, cross sections of the rhabdoms in these three species. And you can see here that in the nocturnal bee, the rhabdom diameter is three times that of the dynal bee, right? So by enlarging or having a much wider rhabdom, essentially they are uh, these nocturnal bees can, uh, you know, have better light gathering capacities at low light levels. They can absorb photons much more efficiently at low light levels. Now, moving on to the, um, you know, to introduce the other, the facultatively nocturnal apis dosata. Now, we are not the only people who've seen nocturnal activity. In fact, in the 80s, Fred Dyer uh, recorded nocturnal activity. And there have been, even before, prior to that, people have reported seeing uh, apis dosata foraging on trees uh, when there is bright moonlit uh, conditions. So, uh, again, this is a night nice system because you have three. Uh, in India, we have sympatric species of uh, honeybees, uh, which are Apis dorsata, Apis serrana, which is the eastern honeybee, and Apis floria, right? And out of which we've seen nocturnal activity, facultatively nocturnal activity in Apis dorsata. Now, here is what it looks like in the same study site where we looked at the carpenter bees. Uh, Apis floria, this is time of the day on the x-axis. You can see that it restricts its activity from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and there is bright light. Uh, this is Apis serrana, again, it's diurnal. And you see here that this is Apis dorsata, and you can see that it's largely diurnal, but there are certain seasons or certain months of the year when they can make these occasional transitions to nocturnality. As you can see, in the month of February and April, this also coincides with the time of high uh, flowering in this community. And they're also restricted to uh, flying out or their nocturnality is restricted to brighter moonlit conditions. Again, when we looked at the eyes of these three species, you find parallel, ad <clears throat> parallel adaptations in dosata. Now, we do find that dosata is, it's definitely a larger bee than the other two species. But if you were to correct for body size, then they have larger eyes, as you can see over here. And we do find that they have much wider rhabdoms as compared to the two diurnal species. Uh, this is a lot of numbers here, but what I'd like to take you through is a few numbers. So the blue columns refer to the carpenter bees and the gray columns refer to the honeybees. And this is the nocturnal carpenter bee. Right. So you can see, for example, that it has a much wider facet as compared to the two dynal species, which allows much more light to enter the eye. And if you were to look at the rhabdom diameter, you can see that it has a much wider rhabdom than the two dynal species. The length of the rhabdom is also longer in the nocturnal species than the two dynal carpenter bees. And if you were to look at the optical sensitivity that these visual parameters give the bee. It has, uh, its eyes are much more sensitive. It's like 27 times more sensitive than the eye of the strictly diurnal carpenter bee, and nine times more sensitive than the carpenter bee species that is facultatively nocturnal. Now you can see parallels over here if you were to compare the three uh, honeybees. Uh, you can again see that their facet diameters are. Uh, you know, uh, their facets are much more wider. They have, uh, you know, uh, their rhabdoms are uh, sort of longer. Um, their uh, rhabdom diameters are wider. They have, um, they also have uh, much more sensitive eyes than the two diurnal species. So what we can say from this and uh, also from work that has been done in the neotropics on the sweat bees, we know that uh, nocturnality, some, uh, there are some common optical adaptations that permit nocturnality uh, in bees with their, in spite of their apposition eyes. And that is that you make your eyes as large as possible. You have much wider facets. You have widened raw, long rhabdoms. 
you have larger acceptance angles and you have very large ocelli. And this is something that has been seen across species, whether you're talking about the paleotropics or whether you're talking, uh, talking about the neotropics. Now, additionally, it has been implied or there is some data to suggest that there could be spatial pooling that's going on in, uh, in order because these adaptations by themselves might not be sufficient or might not completely explain nocturnal uh, behavior in bees. And so, therefore, there could be spatial pooling uh, of signals across several omatidia that might, um, you know, uh, facilitate uh, better nocturnal vision. Now, uh, uh, let's focus on uh, color vision now. So the question, an interesting question that we've been, you know, it's an obvious question. So how do bees uh, detect flowers at night? Are they using color like the diurnal bees or are they relying on brightness information more or are they using scent more and so on, right? So this is something that, uh, and, and why is it that, uh, you know, uh, color vision uh, is unexpected in, uh, in bees is that, or in other nocturnal insects, is that because in order to have better vision, in order to have a, a brighter signal, uh, it is expected that you pool signals from your different spectral classes of your three photoreceptor types, and you know therefore you make a brighter signal, and that comes at the cost of color vision. Right. So here is what we did, where we tested color vision. Uh, and we did this in the field. So this is the first experiment where it was done in nature. Other experiments um, in moths before this experiment uh, have been done in the laboratory conditions, but here is a, is a field experiment and it's a large setup. I will quickly try to take you through this. So one of these, so this is a large sort of a plywood board and there are two side panels and the nest is behind this, okay? So one of these, uh, there are several dummy holes here, and one of this actually leads to the nest, and others are just dummy holes. So during training, we learn, uh, we make the bees learn to associate the nest with a landmark. And during tests, after the bee has been trained, then we provide them with several options of uh, colors, and uh, we allow them to, then we see whether they make the right choices or whether they don't make the right choices. Now, um, we could manipulate all other cues, uh, positional cues, uh, you know, whether the bees would learn these, uh, you know, that the nest was in the um, in the in one end or whether it was in the center and so on uh, by actually, um, you know, being able to slide these uh, panels so that the, you know, when a bee leaves the nest, it may see the nest at this end, but when it comes back, it may see it at the center and so on. So we were trying to take care of all kinds of positional cues. And this is a very large setup, and this is just to give you an idea about the dimensions of the setup over here, right? Uh, now, here is what we did. We trained the bees to yellow, so we placed it over the nest. And in a few days, the bees quickly learned to associate uh, the nest with this landmark. And then we tested them. So after they'd learned, then we tested a bee. When it went out, it just saw the yellow. When it came back, it was confronted by having to make a choice between the training yellow and several other shades of yellow and two shades of gray, okay? And out of the 58 returns to the nest by several bees at several uh, nests, uh, we found that they chose the training yellow and the other yellows predominantly, okay? So it's almost like 99% of the times they chose yellow and it's only 1% of these choices that were to gray. So then we did a second test. And in this test, what we did is that uh, we divided the moon phase into brighter conditions and darker conditions. Uh, by darker conditions, what I mean is like less than 10% of the moon is visible, 10% uh, or lesser. Uh, and brighter conditions are when, you know, uh, it's much brighter towards uh, full moon. So we trained the bee again to yellow. And this time we tested, okay, after they had trained and the bee had gone out. And then when they came back, they had the choice of a yellow color. Uh, they had the choice of greens and grays, right? And here again, what you see is that during brighter conditions, 92% of the times they chose the training color properly without making any errors. Occasionally, they did go to the greens and the grays. And if you were to look at the choices under dim light conditions, then, uh, or you know, basically are moonless uh, nights, you see that even here, they had 
very good um, you know sort of recognition or they could detect the training color very well and they would go back to the nest correctly in more than almost 90% of the choices so what did we conclude from this that uh, we concluded that uh, trancobarica this obligately nocturnal carpenter bee has robust color vision even under low light levels and here when we provided them with uh, you know the a choice of the training yellow with two other shades of yellow they generalized the yellow and they ignored the intensity okay which means that they had actually learned the color very well and when we also uh, provided them with uh, you know greens and grays uh, irrespective of whether the tests were done on under brighter or darker conditions most of the time they chose the yellow color correctly so to summarize this what do we know today about color vision in insects uh, hawk moths were the first uh, nocturnal insects where color vision was discovered and this was discovered by almut kelber uh, where she showed that this nocturnal hawk moth has uh, is capable of color vision at very very low light levels starlight light levels and after that two more hawk moths these are hawk moths that are active during the daytime and also at night and they were also shown to have nocturnal color vision now the thing to remember about moths is that they have superposition eyes which are very different from the apposition eyes which makes their eyes much more sensitive at low light levels compared to the uh, to the apposition eyes yeah in superposition uh, position eyes they can actually pool signals from several uh, neighboring omatidia very well in order to get a brighter signal but apposition eyes that becomes difficult yeah at least at the optical level but uh, so these are the four insects uh, that we know of that have been demonstrated to have nocturnal uh, you know sort of color vision at night so then we said okay now let's move on to test what happens with the facultatively nocturnal tosata right so we did these experiments with um, this is mainly sajesh's work uh, sajesh as well as balu uh, here what we did is that we had uh, you know we had again these experiments were done with natural colonies of apis dorsata we trained them to come to the blue color right and we um, you know so this is a setup into which the bees were trained to fly into through this corridor and once they were in this corridor they uh, you know were trained to blue and then reward associations were made with the blue color and then they were tested and in tests we provided them with the the training blue with a gray that matched the blue in terms of intensity a brighter uh, gray and a darker gray so they had the gray which matched the blue a, a brighter gray and a darker gray which we call here as b e uh, gray equal gray plus and gray minus so uh, here uh, you know uh, let's take a look at the results so here is the proportion of first choices that were made by 20 bees the first visits of the bees and you can see that after training at um, you know this is all daytime experiments they learned the color blue very well right and they made accurate choices uh, this is the total choices made by these 20 bees so they don't just visit one stimuli they make multiple visits and if you pool all those uh, you know multiple stimuli together then and look at the total proportion of choices again you see that the proportion of choices were greater to uh, blue than any of the other three so we did a second experiment with yellow this time training to yellow and here what we did is we changed the orientation in terms of the presentation of the stimuli here it was presented on the floor of this experimental setup and here we decided to present it on the vertical uh, you know surface now again the uh, the results are comparable where we see that they learned the yellow color very well and they chose the yellow color predominantly whether it was first choices or whether it was total choices so these experiments told us that they have quite robust color learn a color uh, discrimination during the daytime so next we looked at their color learning and here we did these experiments during the daytime where we had trained them to yellow right we trained the bees to yellow in the horizontal plane and in tests we provided them with novel colors red green uh, blue and so on and then we could see here again that irrespective of whether we look at the first choices or the total choices made by bees we found that they predominantly learned and chose the training color during the daytime 
So next we did these experiments at night. Okay. Now these light levels roughly are, you know, uh, very bright moonlit conditions. And here what we did is that we had these fly in into a setup like this, right? Uh, where they were trained to blue and then they were offered, you know, the a darker uh, gray, a lighter gray and a gray that matched the blue in terms of intensity. This is the proportion of first choices at bright moonlit conditions. Uh, you know, this is the moonlit, con uh, this is the light levels at that time, 0.1 to 0.2 candelas per meter square. And you can see that they chose the blue uh, over the grays. And the same thing, if you look at the total choices, again, you can see that they chose the blue over the other grays. So this is at a lower light level, which is roughly half moon, right? So here again, you can see that the training and the test paradigm was exactly the same. And you can see that, again, they could discriminate the color blue from the other grays. Right? So this tells us that they have robust color vision, even at half moon light levels. Now at light levels that were lower than that, there appears to be some difficulty in terms of uh, you know, uh, learning this. So they did poorer in the tests. Now, if we were to look at the, uh, the first choices of the bees, you can see that uh, in terms of the performance at higher light levels, you see that the performance was not as good. So there is some evidence that the performance declines. But if you look at, you know, uh, they still seem to be, uh, there's some indication that they're still able to see, uh, you know, uh, blue at these light levels. But uh, perhaps there's also a lot of variation between bees and there's some evidence for degradation of their color vision capabilities at very low light levels. So uh, let us try and summarize this now. So, so here we've added another species. Uh, this is the nocturnal carpenter bee that's obligately nocturnal and it starts its activity at low light levels and it can go down to starlight. And this is uh, Dosata where we've, seen, where we've just shown color vision at, uh, you know, during broad daylight and it could go all the way down to about 10 power minus 2 candelas per meter square. And in comparison, you can see that the hawk moths uh, do better than the facultatively nocturnal bee. But here is a nocturnal bee that does as well as the hawk moths uh, with the apposition eyes. So next we said, uh, let us look at other behaviors in uh, Apis dorsata. So this is quite a, a remarkable behavior where they show this collective uh, defense mechanism against uh, you know, predators such as uh, hornets right, which uh, try to capture the bees as they are returning to the hive. So they show this, color, uh, you know, collective behavior and this, these shimmering waves are produced by bees lifting their abdomens and they do it in some sort of a sequence uh, which creates these big shimmering waves, right. And earlier work by Kasberger has shown that this is a visually guided behavior. And so what we've done here in, in this case is two things. One is to try and see the role of um, contrast and uh, target size uh, in uh, inducing shimmering behavior and also look at uh, whether this response, you know, continues even at low light levels. So here is the experimental colony and this is the experimental setup. Uh, you have a screen, and in front of the screen, you have the a stimulus that is moved, um, you know, either against a black background, as you see, or a lighter gray background on the other side. So we could change the background, and therefore, we could change the contrast between the moving stimulus and the background. Yeah, and this is the hive. So it was fairly close to the hive, about 2.5 meters or so, and all of these rec were recorded. So this is a work that's done by Sajesh. And uh, it's already published and it's a part of his thesis here. So very quickly, let me explain what we tried to do. So uh, image analysis of the shimmers, we uh, quantified the onset, the area of shimmering uh, when the shimmering started and at the peak of a shimmering, uh, you know, a trial and at the offset or when it was completed. So this is what was captured. And to summarize quickly, what we know today is that uh, you know, shimmering occurs when only when a black 
object is moved against a brighter background. So we had a light gray background here, and you can say that in, under all other conditions, right, we don't find shimmering to occur. Now, let us take this case. You have a black background and you have a bright object which is moving, right, in front of the hive, but there is no shimmering, right? And here again, you find that this object is not as bright as this object, but there is still no shimmering. And this, of course, is a black object with, uh, which makes very poor contrast against the background and we expected that there was no shimmering that would occur. Uh, here again, you see that this is a light object against a light background. There was no shimmering or there was very little shimmering. And here again, very little shimmering. But when you have a dark object that moves against a light background, then there was shimmering. Right now, the interesting thing that uh, to be noted here is that it's not just the contrast, okay? Because if it were just the contrast, then you should find shimmering here. But it is also the you know what is in the foreground and what is in the background that matters, okay? So you need to have a black object or a darker object moving against a brighter background in order to elicit this shimmering behavior. Now, under very low light levels, we found that there was almost no shimmering. So this is the uh, summary of the daylight experiments where we found shimmering. But under these conditions, uh, you know, where you had um, a bright background and a dark object moving at twilight, uh, low light conditions, early in the morning before sunrise and late in the night after, uh, you know, late in the evenings after sunset, uh, there was no shimmering, which tells us that this is, in fact, visually mediated. So to summarize these results, what we know is that target size matters, relative contrast matters, but you need a dark object moving against a bright background in order to elicit a shimmering response. Now, we also found another interesting thing, which is that we estimated the, um, you know, the visual detection thresholds. And we found that in this particular anti-predatory response, the you know, the threshold for detection is much smaller or the angle that is required for or the visual angle that is required for detecting uh, in a predatory con uh, context is much smaller than in the foraging context. I'm not showing this data for the foraging context over here, but it just tells us that with the same B, it's the ecological context that matters with respect to what the visual detection thresholds are. We also found, as I just mentioned, that there was no shimmering at uh, twilight, uh, after twilight. And so this defensive behavior appears to be guided lastly by, uh, largely by vision. So in the last part of my talk, I'm going to uh, quickly take you through some of these hypotheses and what evidence we have for either nocturnality being mediated by a rich resource niche or competitive displacement or Tradition, right? Uh, Hema. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I just want to let you know that you will have 12 more minutes, including for questions. Okay. So, I can just um, wrap up in like two, three minutes. Yeah. Okay. It's not going to take long. Yeah. So, here is something. Uh, let me go to the most important slides over here. Now, this is for the nocturnal carpenter bee. And we looked at, um, you know, the pollen that the bees brought back on full moon nights and on new moon nights. So they seem to do better under brighter moonlit conditions and they seem to bring back lesser pollen under darker conditions, right? And if we were to compare the nocturnal bee with the two diurnal carpenter bees, we see that they bring back much smaller or smaller quantities of pollen as compared to the two diurnal species, right? So what this tells us is that they are nocturnal, but in terms of resource gathering, they seem to be do, doing poorer, okay? Now, in terms of the resource types that they were bringing back, and let's focus on this slide over here. Now, here you can see that in terms of the resource types uh, that they were bringing back, so we capture these bees and look at the different kinds of pollen that they were bringing back. What uh, is evident here is that the nocturnal bee was bringing back a greater diversity of pollen types than the other two species. Now, what this tells us, what this result tells us is that during a particular foraging round, when they leave the nest and they come back to the nest and these bees are being captured on their return, they seem to be visiting more species at night 
right, the nocturnal bees than the two dinal species. Or in other words, the dinal bees are much more generalized than generalists than the other two nocturnal species. Uh, sorry, the nocturnal bee is much more specialized, uh, generalized than the other two dinal species. Again, these uh, figures here, very quickly, what it tells us, even just visually inspecting, it tells us that the nocturnal bee is a resource generalist, and so are the other two dinal bees, right? You can see that there is a lot of resource overlap. And uh, from these graphs, what you can say is that, uh, you know, the nocturnal bee over here, if you focus on the species, you can see that they are using flowers that open during the daytime. They're using flowers that open during night. So they're not particularly utilizing just nocturnal flowers. They seem to be utilizing any kind of flower that's available. Um, now, with respect to nest predation, we found that the nocturnal bees are much more vulnerable to nest predation. Okay, here is a uh, bird which has attacked a nest. And uh, you can see here that this is the number of nest attacks that were found in the nocturnal bee and compared to the two dinal species. And you can see that the nocturnal bee nests were much more subject to bird predation than the dinal species. So here again is the degree of nest specialization. You can see that the nocturnal bee is a nest generalist. Okay, the, so they utilize multiple uh, um, tree species for nesting. Whereas these two species appear to be more nest specialists, meaning they occupy, uh, they build their nests on fewer tree species. So what is what do we know from all of this, right? So we have so far discussed, and this is by my last but one slide, I think, uh, that we have seen that there seem to be general adaptations for nocturnality in bees, despite their opposition eyes. Uh, we have seen that color vision doesn't seem to be sacrificed. We know from these two species now that bees are capable of nocturnal color vision. Uh, in the sweat bees, they have not been able to test for color vision or they have not been able to successfully test for no color vision because uh, the sweat bees just make one trip and then they come back to the nest. And largely, there's evidence that they seem to be opportunistic feeders that are not particularly associated with specialized floral traits. And in terms of, um, you know, uh, the carpenter bee, the nocturnal carpenter bee, nest predation seems to be an important factor in uh, mediating nocturnality. And uh, simply because they, uh, you know, face greater nest predation during, uh, you know, from birds. And therefore, it becomes important for them to stay in the nest during the daytime and defend the nest during the daytime. And perhaps this has been important uh, and also competition for nesting spaces seem to be important in mediating nocturnality. In terms of uh, Apis dorsata, possibly, you know, the very large colony sizes uh, make it uh, uh, push this bee towards dim light foraging, especially during mass flowering or when there is sufficient moonlight that's available. Now, in the neotropical carpenter bees, we know that, you know, many of these bees use... Um, Sorry, in the neotropical sweat bees, we know that they can use scent at night. Uh, we don't know to what extent uh, Trancobarica, for instance, uses a nest at night, uh, scent at night. And also, um, in, you know, there is evidence that suggests that multimodal sensory cues are important for nocturnal bees, as it is in the case of dinal bees. So I'll end my talk here and uh, thank you all for listening and you know, a lot of collaborators have contributed to this work so far, and funding agents have funding agencies have you know uh, generously supported our funding. So thank you. Thank you, Emma. Fascinating talk. Thank you. All. Uh, I have some questions already in the YouTube chat, so I'll start with them and then we'll see how that okay. goes. Um, so Alexi asks uh, if you have any idea of the color preference in the species that you did the uh, color experiments with. Are they are the colors that you used? I guess specifically the yellow, based on the on their color preference. Uh, so we uh, we have seen uh, this is not data that I've presented, but in Apis dorsata, for instance, we have seen uh, a preference for blue colors. So uh, we so we did the, the if you remember the dinal uh, color vision experiments we did it with blue but we also did it with yellow 
right? So we uh, they do seem to have some sort of, uh, you know, spontaneous preference, I would say, for blue color, but uh, we've also tested it with yellow. Yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so there's a question by David. Uh, he is asking if human light pollution has caused any problems for these nocturnal species or induced any uh, diurnal species to extend their activity to the night. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, the interesting answer would be that we don't think, uh, you know, uh, uh, light pollution, at least in Apis dosata, for instance, causes them to extend their activity. And the reason I say that is that um, uh, in Apis dosata, the nocturnal activity is very site specific. Okay, you, uh, you're not going to find, first of all, it's going to be seasonal. And secondly, um, it's also uh, very strongly driven by moon phase, okay? And light pollution seems to play a very, very minor role. So in fact, in one of the sites, we saw no activity at all at night. And there was it, this was a heavily light polluted site, uh, but possibly other uh, environmental factors such as precipitation, humidity, temperature, and all of these uh, play an important role. And so despite light pollution, they were not taking advantage of the light pollution in order to be nocturnal. So uh, there is a lot of variation from site to site. And I think that it's much more strongly driven by uh, the moon phase or strongly tied to the moon phase rather than to light pollution. I don't have the answers, convincing answers for it yet. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of questions from Natasha. Um, sh the first thing she says is thank you for your fantastic talk. She is asking if you have any reference papers in mind demonstrating that bees rely primarily on vision for navigation in nature. In nature, okay. Yeah. So yes, there are a lot of reference papers um, that are available to uh, for be uh, demonstrating that but did you say in the context of navigation? Yeah. Or, yeah. Or so was a question in the context of navigation or was it just color vision in bees? What was, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So a color vision in bees, yes, there's a very rich body of literature, uh, mainly from honeybees, the Western honeybee and the bumblebees, but increasingly also the Eastern honeybees and um, the giant honeybees, which we are trying to sort of fill those gaps. Um, she also asked if you have any hypothesis regarding the mechanism that can underlie the modulation of the visual threshold that you mentioned. Okay, so um, there is, um, if you're talking about adaptations at the neural level, so then uh, there is uh, some evidence from the megalopter, the sweat piece, that they might actually be uh, doing spatial summation, right? So at uh, the neuronal level, there might be spatial summation that's going on, which sort of, uh, you know, helps them by having these uh, very branched uh, lateral uh, neurons. So then, uh, you know, they could actually uh, sum signals from several, uh, you know, uh, omatidia in order to get a brighter uh, signal. So there is some evidence there, but uh, for carpenter bees, we don't have any electrophysiology or any such data, neuroanatomical data, because it's very, um, what shall I say, uh, the, the bees are, uh, it's not, it's not, the population sizes are not very large, right? So therefore, it's not easy to do experiments with uh, carpenters. Possibly um, Apis dosata is a subject where it can be done. Good. Uh, I think maybe time for one or two last questions. So Valentin asks if um, similar to the previous question in the experiment where yellow was tested against green and gray, yeah. do you think if you test yellow against other colors like say red and purple, this would be a good way to study color discrimination? Uh, no, we could use other colors, right? We could use any of those colors. Um, uh, it's not an issue. Right, so uh, it's just that for convenience we use these colors. That's all. In fact, there is data with other colors also, which uh, I haven't shown. Okay, I think that is more or less it. So I I also had one question. I am really fascinated by the the shimmering experiments you showed. Um, 
very cool stuff. Uh, have you tried experiments where you have two, say, two objects coming in from opposite ends and, you know, induce shimmering from two sides and, I don't know, cause waves to right. crash or something? Right, yeah. So we haven't tried those experiments. Uh, we did think about it, you know, so if you have, you know, stimuli moving in opposite directions or, you know, you have stimuli moving randomly, right? Because here, uh, in this particular experiment, we had them moving from left to right, li right to left or up and down, right? Mm -hmm. But what if you have random motion and what if you have looming motion, right? So these are some uh, experiments where some preliminary data is there and uh, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, add to that. So, yeah. So interestingly, with looming, the preliminary experiments that we did, we didn't find a, a response. Uh, you know, so, but uh, we don't fully understand that because uh, it's not too many experiments and we, there are certain things that one has to still sort of uh, tweak, you know, before we do those experiments. Fascinating. Yeah. I think it's a very cool collective yeah. behavior system. That you, you should talk share. to Sajesh more about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think that's all the time we have. Um, if you have any more questions for Hema, you can mail her or if she is um, on Discord, you can contact her on her channel and she will be happy to answer questions. So 